Cool. Well, I'm excited to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're working on at BlueCore um, and how I sort of see it per, uh, being involved in the future of e-commerce in general. Um, does this thing work? So uh, BlueCore, what we are is a customer experience platform. What that means is we provide personalization services for specifically e-commerce. I will talk about what that means in a little bit. Um, but what progress we've made in the last three years since we were founded, we have more than 100 employees now. Uh, 300 of the largest brands on the planet are our clients. That includes Nike, that includes Gap, that includes Under Armour. And we've raised over $25 million in venture capital. From a growth perspective, We are growing faster than some of the most successful companies in our technology category, uh, broadly referred to as enterprise SaaS or software as a service. All of these companies are worth more than a billion dollars now. And I bring this up because it begs the question, what the hell is the problem that we're working on that's facilitating this kind of growth in the context of commerce? Um, so a really easy place to start is what is e-commerce and who cares? So let's start with the very trivial question. Uh, E-commerce is not a product. Uh, so unlike a lot of the things we've talked about here, uh, this is not a new product that we are providing. It is a platform for doing things. It's a new way of doing things that we've done for 10,000 years. Notably, it's the new platform for how we actually transact. So if you think about transactions or commerce, really all it refers to is how do we get the stuff we need, whether that be pharmaceuticals, whether that be uh, clothing, any of the kinds of things that we need as, as a society, how does it get to us, right? And when, when we think about the system by which this happens, typically people think about only two steps of it. They think about how does the thing actually get delivered to me? But in reality, this is a very complicated process. There's a bunch of different steps in the system by which we conduct commerce. There's discovery. How do you actually find out the thing that you wanted in the first place? There is search. When you know you want something, how do you actually find it? There's evaluation. How are you evaluating the things that you think you want? Uh, and how do you actually transact? And then how does it actually get delivered? So the system by which we conduct commerce, uh, or e-commerce in general, is just a new way of doing these five things. So historically, the way this has been done is in an offline store, right? So everyone's familiar with walking into a store. Um, there's a bunch of curated products right in front of you. You can feel them, you can play with them, and you can purchase them. E-commerce is just doing these things online. It's just doing them through a digital interface. So who cares? Why does this matter? Well, the system by which we conduct transactions as a society matters for one massive reason, uh, which is that it is way too expensive. So can anyone guess how expensive it is for us in the United States just to conduct one of those five steps, namely delivery? How much money as a society do we spend actually just delivering products from factories to us? So one of the five steps, steps of commerce. Can anyone guess? Other than the two people that have seen the slide deck before. <laughs> Who, what? He's good. 100 billion. Uh, we spend one and a half trillion dollars just on conducting commerce. Come on, there's a big, big number. There we go. Um, I was excited to put this number on the slides. Um, that is a ridiculous amount of money. That is almost 10% of gross domestic product, and that is only one of the five steps of conducting commerce. To put this a little bit in perspective, the entire planet Earth spends $100 billion on cancer treatment a year, and in the United States, to conduct one of the five steps of commerce is $1.5 trillion. So this is important, and it might be trivial, but the effects this has is huge. So because it's so expensive for people to find products and for people to actually conduct commerce, it's harder for entrepreneurs to start businesses. It's harder for people to discover new products when you build them. Um, the adoption of new products takes longer, right? So if you actually have something, uh, it takes a long time for people to actually learn that they actually need it. It takes a long time for them to find it and for them to actually purchase it. Um, things are too expensive. The reason why products are expensive is one, because the manufacturing of it's expensive, but also because marketing is hard, because actually getting it into consumers' hands takes a lot of time. And also, of course, lots of wasted resources. So, the promise of commerce was to solve this, e-commerce. So 20 years ago when e-commerce came around, the reason why there was so much buzz around it is they said we could substantially lower transaction costs. We could make it so much easier for us as a society to buy and sell services. One, because there's consolidated logistics, so instead of having a bunch of little stores, there's one warehouse from which everything's distributed. Um, there's no big retail stores all over the place. 
Um, and search is so much better, right? So if you go to Amazon.com, it takes seconds to find the product you want, as opposed to going to a retail store and perusing a bunch of things. But a common misconception is that this worked. So e-commerce failed. Uh, although these three things are true, e-commerce did not live up to its vision. And if you want proof, this has been the adoption curve of e-commerce. E the vast majority of things are still purchased offline. Only about 10% of things are actually purchased online. So this is why Jeff Bezos says he's still in the early days of Amazon, why everyone says Amazon's mature, start extracting profits. He looks at this curve and says this game is not even over, right? He's only 3% of commerce is actually being conducted on, on Amazon. So the question is, what's wrong with commerce? What's missing? Because it's true that e-commerce is substantially better at those three things. So if we want to investigate that, let's go back to our little simplified model of commerce. So in this world, e-commerce is clearly better at two of these five things, search and purchasing, right? So undeniably, e-commerce, it's much easier to find products that you want, and it's clearly cheaper to get them. When people typically criticize e-commerce, so when they talk about what e-commerce is missing, usually they focus on evaluation and delivery. So they talk about how oh, there's high-touch products that are, you have to actually physically feel, um, or it takes too long to get them. But what I want to argue to you, and it's my view, that these two are not limiting factors. Uh, if you think about companies like Warby Parker, no one would have thought that you would have purchased glasses online, but they have things like home try-on. We're at a place where we have effectively 24-hour delivery. These are not limiting factors. The limiting factor is discovery. Discovery fucking sucks online. It's terrible. Um, nothing has come close to the offline store in the context of discovery. There has never been an innovation as incredible as the offline retail store with curated products for you to walk around and feel when it comes to actually allowing you to discover things that you did not think you wanted. So the future of e-commerce, the biggest problem that has to be solved if we want that adoption curve to change, if we want fundamentally the majority of commerce to happen online, is solving the problem of how do we make discovery happen in a digital interface. And that's what Bluecore is working on. So there are two ways to tackle this problem. Uh, companies like Pinterest are tackling it from one perspective, which is having a third-party service where you can discover things on a third-party platform. We're focusing on something that people don't talk about as much, which is how do you enable the actual retailers themselves to facilitate discovery? So there's two different ways in which retailers can actually facilitate discovery. One is through their own store. So if you want to look at why E discovery sucks so much online, the e-commerce store is not the online equivalent of a re an offline retail store. It's the online equivalent of a catalog. It's just a big shitty catalog with a bunch of products in it. So if you look at Staples, they're clients, so hopefully they don't get mad at me, um, but this is just a bunch of tabs. There's nothing that's curated to me. There's no notion of what I'm interested in. It's just essentially a search tool. And even the more sophisticated retailers like a Nike or an Amazon, this is still just search-based. This has nothing to do with what I'm interested in. They're not using the fact that I've purchased things in the past to personalize this experience. It's just a bunch of search facets. So the e-commerce store itself sucks. The other tool that retailers have uh, is online marketing and advertising, which also sucks. Um, so I'm sure that everyone has seen this. So you've seen a bunch of ads that you hate because you've already purchased these products and they follow you around all over the place. Uh, you've gotten a bunch of emails that mean nothing to you and you just start unsubscribing and deleting. And I'm sure you've gotten some weird ass SMS messages. Um, <laughs> uh, and this all sucks. So the technology problem undergirding both of these is actually the same, right? It's the same technology problem. And the issue is that retailers live on this frontier where they can only optimize for one of two things. So uh, Benedict Evans of Anderson Horowitz, I think said this really well which is all curation grows until it requires search, and all search grows until it requires curation. What effectively he's saying is that you can only have one of these two things and they're both bad. You can either have a really curated experience where I'm showing you exactly what you need to know, phenomenal discovery, or you can have a great search-based experience like an Amazon, but no curation. And if you want to sort of visualize this, this is sort of the graph in which we operate which is what's possible today. So you can either have the blue line is what's possible given technology today. You can either have really, really great search and bad curation. So there's effectively the two websites you saw before. Or you can have phenomenal curation, but really bad search. And if you think about companies that exist today where they fall, Amazon crushes search. 
And when people think about competing with Amazon, the reason why VCs get so excited about DTC brands or demand to consumer brands is because they understand this dynamic, which is Amazon can't compete in that bottom right corner. Warby Parker can own that. So Warby Parker can say, I'm gonna build a very curated experience and I'm just gonna show you exactly the brand that you want. The reason why offline stores win is they live outside of what's possible online, right? So they live sort of outside of this frontier. So the answer to solving discovery in e-commerce is breaking this continuum. And buying things online for the first time ever actually enables you to have both of these things at the same time. So broadly what we call this at Bluecore is personalization at massive scale, which means that everyone should get a different experience based on who you are on an online store. It should be curated but still facilitate search. So that's what we're working on at Bluecore. Um, there's two broad technology problems that sort of are underlying solving personalization at massive scale. One is actually being able to use predictive analytics to understand who people are. So I'll talk about that in a second. And the second is just because you know who someone is or you've, been in, you've inferred who someone is doesn't mean you necessarily have the technology to change a site experience or change a marketing experience on the basis of it. So first, what we're working on is we actually can use predictive analytics to figure out who doesn't want to get any more annoying emails. So we're doing this for a variety of different brands, which is we can guess who's no longer engaged or who's unlikely to be engaged. Um, we can also infer what types of new products that you maybe never knew about you would be interested in. So we can do some really cool things with data science to actually assess, we think these types of consumers or these individuals would be interested in these new things that you just merchandised. And there's a bunch of other things we're doing uh, in inferring what, who customers are. In terms of changing experiences, so this is something we're doing for Nike. So the left is what they were doing before Blue Core, which is one marketing message for everyone, right? And this is why we all hate the emails that we get, because they don't mean anything. But imagine you're a runner, and you purchase very specific running products. You should get only running experiences from Nike. So now there's actually an individual experience generated by Blue Core for every one of Nike's customers, and none of them get the same exact email. And if you are someone who is a runner, you are not going to get recommended basketball products. You're only going to get a running experience. And only if you actually like being communicated to via the email channel. So we're actually facilitating them uh, having discovery through a given channel and only the people that want to be communicated to via it. Um, we're doing some cool things in digital advertising. So I hate ads too. I'm not advocating digital advertising in its existing form. Uh, but here's something really cool we're doing for Staples. So let's say that you really wanted this keyboard. Probably none of you do, but let's just say you did. Um, and let's say you trust that Blue Core correctly assessed that you did want it. So let's just let's take that as given. But you didn't buy it because of its price. We've all done that, right? We've all found products and wanted them, but didn't buy it because of the price that it was at. And let's say two weeks later it dropped in price to a price that you would buy it. How would you find out? You wouldn't, right? There's no way for you to discover the fact that now it's actually lower and you would buy it. So what we're doing is we're actually using digital advertising as a discovery channel to provision useful information to consumers. So uh, we're actually doing this for Staples where only for the people that wanted it but didn't buy it due to price, we will notify them if the price drops to a threshold that we think they would buy it at. So it's becoming a useful discovery tool um, for pricing. We do the same thing for inventory levels, right? So let's say you wanted something but it was out of stock and then it comes back in stock. We'll notify people that didn't buy it or were unable to buy it because it was uh, unavailable. So I don't have time uh, to talk about all the different things that we're working on, uh, but a little bit about sort of where we're going. Uh, the two main focuses for us are one, uh, we wanna focus on making better predictions about who you are. So obviously, you know, everyone here is, is aware of all the really cool things going on with AI, machine learning, predictive analytics, data science. Uh, we wanna take all the innovations happening in those fields and use it to better predict things about consumers and what consumers want which means how do we make the digital experience one that you can find things you didn't know that you wanted in the first place and facilitating e-commerce companies actually enabling them to do that to their own consumers. And second, notice everything we focus on thus far has been with marketing and advertising. We're actually gonna move into the e-commerce store. So in the next few months, there's gonna be a very cool pilot where depending on your preferences, when you go to one of the big brand names, which I can't say yet, um, you're gonna see a completely different experience depending on what we think you would like based on what you've done in the past. Um, so everyone will have a very unique curated experience but still have that really robust search. So really facilitating personalization at a, at a big scale. So uh, in conclusion, uh, the future of e-commerce is about solving this big problem of discovery. That is the big thing that we're working on at Blue Core and we'll continue working on and I uh, hope this was fun.
Thanks, folks. Oh, hold on. And uh, I just wanted to give a uh, big shout out to Michael Weiss and Marcus Jacklin for having the grit to put together such a phenomenal event. I just want a big, uh, big round of applause for them. Thank you, Maxwell. Uh, we actually have a minute for like a question or two, if anyone has a question. Bam. Have you thought about augmented reality at all? I think about it all the time. Uh, oh yeah. In the context of uh, what we're working on now, no. Um, I think there's some really interesting things that other companies are working on uh, in terms of facilitating, uh, in terms of facilitating that evaluation step. So, uh, one thing that VR can be really helpful for uh, is instead of doing home try-on, which is sort of an expensive form of evaluating something online, I could actually try it on in a VR experience, right, and see if I actually like the product itself. Um, so there's some really cool companies doing that. Uh, I don't think Blue Core right now uh, is in a position to be the best at it, so that's why we're not focusing on it, but there's some cool stuff going on there. Uh, what are your biggest for data? For data what? Yeah, so uh, actually one of the biggest challenges, a great question, uh, is data acquisition. So one of the big things that we at Blue Core focused on, I didn't talk about it here, um, but uh, is, is what we call data acceleration, which is finding ways in which we can make it really easy to acquire information from retailers. So we actually have an entire team at Blue Core focused on building custom adapters to each website that allows us to track uh, on-site activity in an anonymous way um, to cluster customers together to infer data. Um, there's a bunch of really good third-party data sources that we haven't tapped into yet. Um, but yeah, it's something we think a lot about. I see a hand way in the back there. Yes, absolutely. So privacy is a, is a big uh, concern for sure. Um, the way we think about it is if you make a better consumer experience uh, and you're not uh, violating uh, sort of core terms of service of a retailer, uh, then it's fine. Um, and I think it's always making sure there's a two-way conversation with consumers as to what they want. Uh, a big trade-off is, uh, does a consumer want to have a curated experience? And if so, then they can opt into sharing information about what they're browsing. Uh, and if not, then they can not have a curated experience, and it should be a consumer's choice. The cool thing, though, uh, is data science has gotten to the point where you actually don't need that much data to really change uh, the way in which we shop online. So you would think that I would need to know everything about you to provide a curated experience. I probably just need to know the last two things you purchased and maybe something you viewed online to make a pretty accurate assessment about something that you'd be interested in. Um, so often, I think privacy concerns are a little overblown sometimes, um, but it should definitely be a two-way conversation with consumers. Yes, that's our vision. Absolutely. <laughs> Glad you think so. In the back, back there. Last one, by the way. Yep. Yeah, totally great question. Um, so two things. One, I think for smaller brands, um, remember I was saying that there's sort of two ways to tackle the problem of discovery. One is from the brand perspective and one is from a third party network perspective. I think for smaller brands, folks like Pinterest are super important because they are the platform on which you discover things online. Um, the other piece is if you can make marketing and advertising really, really targeted, um, it actually facilitates smaller brands finding the customers they want. So some really cool things that we're doing, we have some smallish retailers, five million uh, in revenue a year online, where we can actually look at their existing customer base and say, these are the consumers that are driving the vast majority of your profits. And what you're, the problem with your existing acquisition uh, channels is that you're trying to find people who are similar to your entire consumer base, instead of finding people who are similar to your best customers. And when you actually enable a retailer to answer that question, then they can go to Facebook, then they can go to Google, and they can go to all these platforms, and then they can do lookalike audiences, and they can do some really cool things and find similar people. Um, so that's sort of how I see us fitting in with the, the smaller folks. Sick. All right, before we clap, the last talk of World's Fair Nano is happening immediately following Max's departure from the stage. It's the future of media with Alex Klokas, the founder of futurism.com. So let's clap for Max and then have an amazing future of media talk. <laughs> <laughs>